work has been done in the psychological and social field where little has been written about the role of gender in space and vice versa. Politics of space are always sexual, even if architectonic space endeavors to erase sexuality. It is therefore necessary to identify the close relationship between both terms, a relationship which is hidden between uh, the within everyday practices. My concern is not how sexuality acts itself out in space, but first, how is the question of space already inscribed in the question of sexuality? Therefore, it is time to discuss the issue of the bivalent phases of gender as it bears on the fate of place. Place and gender, place as sexually specific, sexual identity as place bound. These uh, questions arise and we have to find an answer for them. I claim that while modernist architecture provided a frame for the feminine body, a body that while acting like a surface, it orchestrated the male gaze directed at it to produce the effect of the very realm of women. This tragedy concealed the fact that it was the power of the male gaze who produced this space of women's confinement, thereby instituting a masculine space of control and discipline. I further claim that nowadays there are certain tendencies in architecture that while neutralizing any gendered production of place, they paradoxically produce an inversion of space as containment, a fluid and formless space that resists hierarchies and control such that it can become anyone's proper place. In order to develop these thesis, uh, these issues, I will first deal with Luce Irigaray's conception of the sexual difference as it relates to place. In a second step, I will recur to Beatrice Colomina to il illustrate the issues of women's containment in architectural places. And finally, I will shortly delve into some present redef redefinitions of the role played by gender in the constitution of space. Let us start with, from the first inquiry into place, that is of Aristotle. From at least Aristotle onwards, it has been assumed that sexual difference makes no difference what it, when it comes to matters of place and space. As Luce Irigaray uh, writes, we must therefore reconsider the whole question of our conception of place, both in order to move on to another age of difference, each age of thought corresponds to a particular uh, time of meditation and difference, and in order to construct an ethics of the passions. How can we mark this limit of a place, of place in general, if not through sexual difference? Only Irigaray and later on Colomina explore the pertinence of sexual difference in the body of men and women as the, this difference relates to place. Their concern is both um, is, uh, with bodily bearings and practices that are specifically uh, sexed or sexuated. Quite another approach is held by those who claim that both sex and gender are culturally determ determin determined as effects of this curse modes of performance or stages in a coherent historical genesis. Examples for the first is Michel Foucault, The History of Sexuality, for the second, uh, Dirty Butler, Gender Travel. Um, so the question of gender in place um, implies a return to an ancient conviction, conviction that sexual identity does make a difference in how place is conceived and experienced by human beings. Irigaray takes us back to primal origins. She takes us back to a resolutely sexed as well as sexual body. She does so in the form of a commentary on uh, Aristotle's physics uh, book, Fear. Four. For, uh, for Irigaray, there is no, no being in place except for a being who is already differentiated in accordance with bodily specificity. Irigaray will attempt to restore both kinds of significance to place, but only insofar as place is understood as something sexually significant to begin with. As for women, the second uh, quotation, she is place. Uh, so she, it's a place, the woman is a place twice over, as mother and as woman, as woman in a place. Does she have to locate herself the place that she is? If she is unable to constitute within herself the place that she is, she passes ceaseless through the child in order to return to herself. Rather than just being the first or last place, or the last place, rather than just being the first or last place for a single kind of other, for example, a man, she's also a place in relation to a child, her own mother or God. 
Ultimately, she becomes the pace that she is only across or through the others. Yet the female body becomes uh, the intensely extensive space is not only through interaction with other places, but also through her own. For their body is already a place insofar as it is itself an envelope containing a receptacle. She says she is able to move within place as place within the availability of place, given that her issue is how to trace the limits of place herself so as to be able to situate herself therein and welcome the other there. If she is to be able to contain, to envelop, she must her have her own envelope, not only her clothing and ornaments of seduction, but her skin, and her skin must contain a receptacle. Like the Platonic receptacle, the Lycora, like woman as place is a moving force. But unlike Cora, she is this as double envelope, at once enveloping by the skin of her entire body and enveloped in her womb. For a general thesis uh, emerges from Irigaray's densely digestive, uh, digestive writing. The point is not just that there is no place without body or vice versa, but that body itself is place and that place is as body bound as the body itself is sexually specific. She says, but women are deprived of their proper place, their topos idios. She says the maternal feminine remains the place separated from its own place, deprived of its place. She is or ceaseless becomes the place of the other who cannot separate himself from it. Without her knowing or willing it, she is, uh, she is then threatening because of what she lacks, a proper place. Rethinking uh, female sexuality, Perhaps you may help. Work. Yeah, and that was what work. Yes, rethinking female sexuality in architectural uh, terms, that is, as an architecture of the body and the bodily architecture, one confronts a lack of mobility. The cultural and historical association of the female subject within, a, within an enclosed space goes, goes along with the positioning in the space of to be looked at nest. Confined in the private, uh, made to feel at home in the home, women's sexual field is restricted while her field of motion is sexualized. Colomina's essays, The Split Wall, Domestic Wireism, also engage the discourse of looking, inscribing a spectatorial position architecture, constructing itineraries of observation. Colomina reads architecture as a domestic space, like uh, in, in, in sort of like a film. She says, to live is to leave traces. It is to be both actor and spectator, even voyeur. She departs from a strong thesis. Architecture, the quotation, is not simply a platform that accommodates the viewing subject. It is a viewing mechanism that produces a subject. It precedes and frames its occupant. This becomes evident in the architecture of Adolf Loos. He was one of that generation of innovators in architecture born in or about 1870. Le Corbusier and Miss van der Rohe uh, are uh, half a generation, come half a generation later. Um, Luz is central to the main issue of modernism. In his famous Ornament and Crime, an, an essay, he declares that ornament equals crime. Luz had the audacity to sweep corrupt and meaningless ornament of the drawing board, who dared to show elevation as snake walls with openness as simple rectangles cut out as if they, if they were with a knife. Luz refers to the idea of the theater box, in noting that, that the smallness of a theater box would be unbearable if one could look out into the larger space beyond. For Luz, the theater box implies a from the world. The spatial psychological device could also be read in terms of power, regimes of control inside the house. The raised sitting area of the Moller house, you see it on the, on the plan, provides the occupant with a vantage point overlooking the interior. Comfort in this space is related to both intimacy and control. 
This area is the most intimate of the sequence of living spaces. The ladies' room is placed on the periphery, pushing a volume out of the street facade. We saw it under here. This is the street, the um, women's room. The occupant of this space can both detect anyone crossing or trespassing the threshold of the house and monitor any movement in the interior. Here, the window is only a source of light, not framed for a view. The gaze is turned towards the interior. Here, the exterior view depends upon a view of the interior. The look folded inward upon itself can be traced in another loose interiors in the Müller house. For instance, there the sequence of spaces articulated around the staircase follows an increasing sense of privacy from the drawing room to the dining room and study to the ladies room, Zimmer der Rame, with its raised sitting area which occupies the center or heart of the house. This space assumes both the character of a sacred space and a point of control. Comfort is paradoxically produced by two seemingly opposing conditions, intimacy and control. There is a theater box inside the house overlooking the internal social spaces. The classical distinction between inside and outside, private and public, object and subject becomes convoluted. The raised alcove of the Moller House and the Zimmerda Dame of the Müller House not only overlook the social spaces but are hidden away. They are exactly positioned at the end of the sequence on the threshold of the private, the secret, the upper rooms. It is the mother who guarantees the privacy of the home by maintaining its respectability as essential in defense against incursion or curiosity as the encompassing walls of the home itself. The house is the stage for the theater of the family. Lou's architecture of pleasure is an architecture of the warmth. This tension between sensation of comfort and comfort as control disrupts the role of the traditional system of representation housed as a shelter from nature, privileges the bodily experience of space over its mental construction. The architect first senses the space, then he visualizes it. The exterior of the, um, and this uh, are gender loaded, he says, the exterior of the house, loose rights, should resemble a male mask. As a unified self, the exterior is masculine. The interior is the scene of sexuality and reproduction. This is the place of the female. In the houses of Le Corbusier, the reversed condition of loose interiors may be observed. The look is directed to the exterior. In such deliberate manner as to suggest the reading of these houses as frames for a view. These frames are given temporality through the promenade. Unlike other of Oslo's houses, perception here occurs in motion. You see in the middle of the design, there is a ramp. There was, it was the first architect to introduce a ramp into the house. Yes, structuring and occupying the center of a house. Um, Perceptor here occurs in motion that this movement, the promenade architectural, is designed, yes, to um, overview the house and to structure the house, the home. In the photos here, we are literally following somebody, for example, here. Point of view is that of the voyeur. Women, for example, in the next one, always look away from the camera. They almost never occupy the space center as men. Here again, the woman is placed inside, the man outside. The woman looks at the man, the man looks at the world. The inward gaze, the gaze toward interior in uh, loose interiors becomes with Le Corbusier a gaze of domination over the external world. It is this domestication of the view that makes the house a house rather than the provision of a domestic space, a place in the traditional sense. The subject of Le Corbusier works is the movie actor. The humanist eye, um, sorry, the organizing geometry of architecture slips from the perspectival cone of vision from the humanist eye to the camera angle. This slippage is not neutral in gender terms. Women, says uh, Le Corbusier, are the object of another's gaze. Modern women, this is the quotation, has cut her hair. Our gazes have known enjoy the shapes of her hair, of the shape of her legs, writes Le Corbusier. A picture, a woman, she is nothing. She is an attachment to a wall that is no longer simply there. 
enclosed by a space whose limits are defined by a gaze. Women then is the object of the other's gaze. She's a picture, prisoner in a space, which limits are defined by the other's gaze. She's the place for the other's gaze and pleasure. So um, let us let let us now also to um, make a switch and um, return or look at, at uh, more contemporary conceptions of a uh, space and of the body. Um, for this uh, purpose, it's um, it's relevant to concentrate on Merleau-Ponty's notion of the flesh. By means of this concept of flesh, Merleau-Ponty overcomes Husserl's constitutional phenomenology uh, and thus the split between the body as organ of perception and the world as field of perception. The flesh constitutes a, a sensuous principle whose cardinal point is the own body. The body, says Merleau-Ponty, is towards space in the sense of an embodied attuned being in. The flesh is thereby a means of communication, a general location between the visibility of things and the bodiliness of the subject who sees. The decisive point here is that the body does not constitute space, but is organically intertwined with it, that this space is already built into the bodily structure. The flesh has a point-for-point -point congruence with the attributes of both femininity and maternity. By the flesh, the visible and the tangible are intertwined. In this connection, Merleau-Ponty privileges vision in terms of metaphors of fluidity and absorption. For Idigaray, these metaphorics of fluidity are emblematic of femininity. Precisely, this formlessness and fluidity is enhanced by contemporary architectonical practices. Um, the representational thus, the representational constraints we faced in uh, traditional architecture give place to a new aesthetic dimension. This is the bodily experience of space, where the presumption of a binary gender system is cancelled out by a neutralization of gender differences. Um, Therefore, um, what we encounter uh, or what we encounter is a um, negation of clear visibility of a univocal sense in favor of a grey or turbid visibility of multiple senses, a wild gaze in Malopanti sense. Um, a wild gaze that implies a wild meaning that is an expression of experience by experience. Far from being reassembled into synthesis, it is experience itself which conveys meaning, as Merleau-Ponty points out in the wake of Husserl. Conceiving space as in a state of flux is precisely the strategy employed by Saha Hadid, who conceives complex concepts or formal repertoires of modernism, which was founded on space. Parametricism is the new design method which um, differentiates fields which are as filled with fluid medium. She says, from composition of parts, we proceed to dynamic fields of particles. This new sensibility avoids clear cut zones or places, avoids repetition, and conceives space as a fluid such as the dream of pure form is disturbed. Conventionally, conceived place as a container is transformed into a fluid where limits become elastic and there is no longer a distinction between exterior or interior, nor territoriality. Place becomes the contrary of what Aristotle conceived of, a formless fluid. But there is an inversion. If modern discourse have, had not granted women with a proper place, now it is the woman herself who makes and produces her own place. The whole building, yes, now the whole architectural space becomes her place, the place of the annulation of hierarchies, of domination and of the controlling gaze. Thank you very much.